Good morning, everybody. We are live on Facebook at this point. So welcome to all the folks who are joining us on Facebook. Welcome to all the folks, uh, those of you who are with us here on Zoom. Uh, we'll have a coffee hour after the service today that'll be on Zoom. So for Facebook folks, we invite you to come on over after the service. I want to call your attention, you'll see it again, to the photo on your screen. There is a fig tree uh, planted in the middle of a vineyard. And that will be of some significance later on in the sermon. Wanted to spend a couple of minutes with some Zoom etiquette uh, reminders uh, that as we've gone through these weeks, um, feel like maybe we need to reiterate. A lot of you um, are, on, are on iPads or phones or computers. Want to, rem want to remind you that wherever your camera is pointed is what we all can see. So if you decide to get up and rearrange your pillow in the back of your chair, and turn your rear end to the to the camera, that's what we get to see. Or if you uh, just lay your device down for some reason or another, uh, we get to see your ceiling. So just a reminder to uh, be aware that what your camera sees is what we see. Also, uh, the other reminder is that what your device hears often ambient noise or noise that we don't hear anymore because we're so used to it. But what your device hears, we hear. And even if it's a whisper or a rustling of papers, we can hear what your device hears. So on a funny side, it can be, oh, so-and-so is making coffee or so-and-so is inviting somebody to dinner. But again, it becomes distracting for everybody uh, because your device is picking up the sound. And related to that, uh, we ask for you to stay on mute then, unless we ask you to unmute. And the way that this program seems to be working is that we can mute all of you, but each of you can unmute yourselves. But please don't do that unless it comes to a point in the service um, where we've asked you to. So I think that'll make things a little smoother for us and uh, we'll appreciate if, if that's what you're able to do. So with those cautions and, um, and suggestions, uh, we're ready to start the service. It's the second Sunday after the Epiphany. And we'll begin with our prelude, Star in the East.
our opening hymn is, Will You Come and Follow Me? With a reminder, as I mentioned, you're all muted. So you can sing along with Maddie and sing uh, joyfully and mightily without needing to worry about uh, anybody hearing you, if that's a concern. So will you come and follow me? Blessed be the one holy and living God, and blessed be God's kingdom now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. And we say together the Gloria. 
glory to God in the highest and peace to God's people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you and also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, whose Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, is the light of the world, grant that your people, illumined by your word and sacraments, may shine with the radiance of Christ's glory, that he may be known, worshiped, and obeyed to the ends of the earth through Jesus Christ our Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns one God, now and forever. Amen. The first reading is from Samuel. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called, Samuel, Samuel. And he said, here I am, and ran to Eli, to Eli, and said, here I am, you called for me. But he said, I did not call, lie down again. So he went and lay down. The Lord called again, Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, here I am for you called me. But he said, I did not my call my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again a third time. And he got up and went to Eli and said, here I am for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore, Eli said to Samuel, go, lie down. And if he calls you, you shall say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, speak, for your servant is listening. Then the Lord said to Samuel, see, I am about to do something in Israel that will make both ears of anyone who hears it of it tingle. On that day, I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I have told him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew because his sons were blaspheming God and he did not restrain them. Therefore, I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be expi expiated by sacrifice or offering forever. Samuel lay there until morning. Then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli. But Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son, he said, here I am. Eli said, what was it that he told you? 
Do not hide it from me. May God do so to you and more also if you hide anything from me of all that he told you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. Then he said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. As Samuel grew up, the Lord was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel was a trustworthy prophet of the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our psalm today is portions of Psalm 139, found there on your screen, which we will read together. Lord, you have searched me out and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You trace my journeys and my resting places and are acquainted with all my ways. Indeed, there is not a word on my lips, but you, O Lord, know it altogether. You press upon me behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain to it. For you yourself created my inmost parts and you knit me together in my mother's womb. I will thank you because I am marvelously made. Your works are wonderful and I know it well. My body was not hidden from you while I was being made in secret and woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my limbs yet unfinished in the womb. All of them were written in your book. They were fashioned day by day when as yet there was none of them. How deep I find your thoughts, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I were to count them, they would be more in number than the sand. To count them all, my lifespan would need to be like yours. Our second reading is from Corinthians. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are beneficial. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is meant not for fornication, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Should I therefore take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that whoever is united to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For it is said, the two shall be one flesh. But anyone united to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Shun fornication. Every sin that a person commits is outside the body, but the fornicator sins against the body itself. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. 
When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said of him, here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered, do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, very truly I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the son of man. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Well, good morning again. I am aware from my own experience that we don't like to be totally honest, totally vulnerable, totally genuine most of our days. There's a study that says that we all lie in some way, something like 14 times a day. And those can be lies like, oh yes, that dress does look lovely on you. Or they could be more ser serious lies. Will you go and do this? Oh yes, I will and no, you don't, or is there a problem that we're having here? No, no problem, but yes, there is. So it's hard for us sometimes to be ourselves with those around us. And sometimes when we are more ourselves, around a special person, we call that person a friend. Maybe you recall the uh, phrase that was, a friend is someone who knows all about you and still likes you. Well, we're going to talk about knowing and being known today. I want to give you a little reprise of Epiphany, though, and what it's about. Epiphany, you recall, the word means a revelation or a manifestation. And in this season of Epiphany, week by week, it is being revealed to us who Jesus is. We're experiencing the epiphany of recognizing Jesus as the child of God. And we do this through a series of stories that come up year after year. The first one is the story of the Magi bringing gifts to Jesus. And that represents in some ways uh, the understanding that the Gentiles from far away even recognize who Jesus is. There's always the story of the baptism of Jesus where the Holy Spirit descends like a dove and the voice from heaven calls, you are my beloved. With you, I am well pleased. And the revelation there, of course, is that voice from heaven identifying Jesus. We also might claim that for ourselves, that we are the child of God and with us, God is well pleased. Today is one of the core stories of Epiphany in the calling of the disciples. And this year, we're going to hear two versions of that this week and next week. In some years, we have the story of Jesus' first miracle, the turning of the water into the wine at the wedding of, in Cana. And then always the ultimate story of revelation and epiphany is the transfiguration where Jesus appears on the mountain with Moses and Elijah, and uh, the voice from heaven again comes and says, this is my son. 
So in various ways through the season of Epiphany, we hear of revelations of who Jesus is. But we frequently talk about epiphanies that come to us, realizations, revelations that come to us. And I think that's part of epiphany as well. I want to suggest today that even though our lessons include the calling of the disciples, their recognition of who Jesus is, that there is for us a revelation of freedom, an epiphany of freedom, to be who we are, to be who we truly are. I might say it this way, to know someone is good, but to be known, especially by God, is really good. To be seeking God is good, but to be found by God is good indeed. And so we might look at the story of Samuel to start. As the lesson implied, Eli has been the priest at the temple, and this is sort of a liminal moment in the history of Israel. And it turns out that Eli has some sons, and these sons have become corrupt. And Eli, who is responsible for their behavior, in a sense, has tolerated it. He has not um, uh, disciplined his sons so that they stop their, uh, their behavior. And so... God is going to call Samuel as a prophet who's going to tell the truth to Eli. And we hear that part at the end of that lesson where Eli even welcomes the news that Samuel's going to bring, which in itself is the sign of a prophet, someone who, sings, who brings truth to power, who says those things that aren't necessarily popular. But what's interesting about the book of Samuel is what we call the call of Samuel. Samuel is going to be raised up as a new prophet, the first of the prophets, and there he is in the temple uh, ministering under Eli. He's sort of a, well, we might call him a sacristy rat or a, um, a student of the scriptures and, and the temple. And there, he's lying there asleep, and he hears God calling him, Samuel, Samuel. And he makes the right response. Here I am, thinking that Eli has called him. He goes to Eli and asks him, and Eli says, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. And so Samuel goes back to bed. And he hears this voice again calling him, Samuel, Samuel. And once again, he gets up, he goes to Eli, whose voice he thinks it is, and says, here I am. You called me. And Eli said, no, I didn't. And so Samuel, who we're told does not yet know the Lord, the word of the Lord has not yet been revealed to him. Samuel goes back and lays down, and he's called a third time. He goes to Eli one more time. Here I am, for you called me. And it was then, after these three times, that Eli realizes that it's God who's calling the boy. And so Eli gives him that, that direction, go and lay down again. And if he calls you again, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And so lo and behold, once again, the Lord calls and Samuel responds, I am listening. And that is when uh, God gives the directions to Samuel about how he is to speak to Eli and to anyone 
in Israel who he will be a prophet to, even as much as that their ears will, will tingle at the sound of the truth, no matter how difficult it is. But the interesting thing about Samuel is that there he is in the temple. It's almost like there he is in church and the place where you would think that you would recognize God's voice speaking to you. And it takes three times plus before Eli and Samuel recognize that it is God who is calling them. But notice, God is seeking him. God is looking for him. And at the end, even though it's taken a bit of time, Samuel is found by God. So then we move to our gospel story today. And it would have been helpful if the lectionary had included chapter one of, uh, or more, more portions of chapter one in John's gospel, because before our reading, there is the calling of two disciples, Andrew and Simon Peter, who have uh, become disciples after encountering Jesus. And speaking of seeking and finding, Jesus has gone to Andrew and to Peter and asked them, who are you looking for? Who are you seeking? And Jesus's words to them about how to find the Messiah are come and see. And when Andrew and Peter come and see and encounter Jesus, they realize that they have found the Messiah. So in seeking, they have found the Messiah. And in that sense also, we will suggest that to find Jesus is also to be found. But then we go into our story of the day and we see that the next day, Jesus decides to go to Galilee. So he's already got Andrew and Peter and he finds Philip. Notice Jesus finds Philip. Perhaps it's almost that Jesus is also seeking. He finds Philip and says, follow me. He didn't just run across Philip. He didn't just bump into Philip. He found him. And then notice that Philip finds Nathaniel. So Jesus actually has found Andrew and Peter and then Jesus has found Philip, and now Philip has found Nathanael and proclaims, we have found him upon who Moses and the law and the prophets spoke. It's Jesus. Well, we don't know if there's a piece of humor here where Jesus or where Nathanael says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Jesus responds, oh, you are an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. We don't know if that's a little joke that's going on be between the two. But right before that, notice again that Philip says to him, come and see. So there's this invitation, not that you must or you ought to follow Jesus, but come and see if this is what you want to do. And so, as I said, Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said, um, you are an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. And Nathanael asks a funny question. Where did you get to know me? Where did you get to know me? Isn't that maybe a question that Andrew and Peter and Philip and even Samuel could ask, God, where did you come to know me? 
that you would call me or find me in these places. And Jesus has a funny answer. He says, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Well, at first I was like, what is so miraculous about that? To see somebody sitting under a tree. If I look out in my backyard or all around my neighborhood where there are plenty of trees, surely I would see someone who is sitting under a tree. What is so amazing that Philip says, or excuse me, that Nathaniel says, how did you know me? And Jesus says, I saw you under the fig tree. Even before Philip called you. Well, here is a picture of a fig tree in a vineyard. And in ancient Israel, frequently fig trees and vineyards were planted together. In addition to that, fig trees were valued highly because they had figs, which not only could be eaten fresh, but they could be dried and then used as um, a food later on. They also produced fruit twice a year, so they were very productive. And as you can see from the width of that tree, it gives a lot of shade in a hot climate. But if you look, my question makes some sense. How is it that Jesus would even see Nathaniel under the fig tree? If Nathaniel is sitting under the fig tree, getting some shade, and those, those rows of vineyards are laying all around there like that, how is it that Jesus saw Nathaniel under the fig tree even before Philip called him? That, my friends, I want to suggest is the power of God's vision to see and to know us, even when in our eyes, we might be unseen or unknown. We might and the world might never see us because we're under a fig tree, but the power of God is to see us and is to know us even there. That to me would explain why Nathaniel's reply to that is, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel because he knows that he is known and he now knows that he is seen. Nathaniel understand that that's the vision of God. And so he sees that in Jesus. And Jesus promises that you see me as the son of God, you're going to see even greater things. And it seems like there's a reference there, uh, perhaps to the crucifixion and the resurrection. Scholars have different understandings about what it means for the heavens to open and the angels of God ascending and descending. But Nathaniel becomes a follower at that point. We don't, we don't hear anything more about him in the scripture, but Nathaniel becomes a disciple because he is known and seen. Wasn't that something that each of us wants? Not just to be known and seen by our friends, but to be known and seen by the one who has created the universe and who sustains it and continues that creation. Isn't that what we truly want in our hearts? And isn't that even 
what can motivate us and give us that confidence to do what God calls us to do because we are known and seen. The psalmist knew this. In Psalm 139, the psalmist talks about how God knows us and sees us, not just now, but here's the line I love. My body was not hidden from you while I was being made in secret and woven in the depths of the earth. And woven in the depths of the earth. It's not that just that God knows us when we were a twinkle in our parents' eye, but God knows us even before that. And God knows us as wonderfully made, as, uh, as wonderfully made and marvelously made. As I said, it, it is even as God would have said to us as he said to Jesus, with you, I am well pleased. God sees our rising up and our lying down, our journeys and our resting places, what we say and what we think. God hems us in, not in the sense of confining us, although that's part of it, but we can't escape from God's knowledge of us. Now, that could be a good or a bad thing, actually, when I think about it. This is where that part about someone who knows all about you and still likes you. God knows all about us and still deeply loves us. Surely we all have things that, in addition to us being wonderfully and marvelously made, would not be things that we would want to say to other people about who we are or what we've done. But God's knowledge of us is perfect, meaning totally whole. From before the time that was before the time that we were born to today and will know us perfectly into the future. In that sense, we can rest in God's knowledge of us. Because it's better to be known by God than just to know. That perhaps is what Nathaniel understood and what these disciples understood, that to be known by God was life-giving, was that which invigorated their lives. And the idea here then, of course, is that that's what invigorates our lives. And in fact, gives us freedom. That's the epiphany to me of the freedom, that God knows us perfectly and loves us perfectly, that God sees us perfectly and loves us perfectly. So we then become to be at a place where we are totally known, but we can totally be who we are in the world. As our opening song said, Will you love, will you love the you you hide if I but call your name? Will you quell the fear inside and never be the same? Will you use the faith you found to reshape the world around? Though my sight and touch through my sight and touch and sound in you and you in me. Christ, your summons echoes true when you but call my name. Let me turn and follow you and never be the same. In your company, I'll go 
where your love and footsteps show. Thus I'll move and live and grow in you and you in me. That is seeking and being found. That is knowing and being known because it does lead to action. One last thought about that. Tomorrow is Martin Luther King Jr. holiday. His birthday was on the 15th, but as a national holiday, it's the third Monday in the month. But Martin Luther King talks about uh, his vision in the kitchen. He calls it uh, an epiphany he had in his kitchen. And here's what he said. I was ready to give up. With my cup of coffee sitting untouched before me, I tried to think of a way to move out of the picture without appearing a coward. In this state of exhaustion, when my courage had all but gone, I decided to take my problem to God. With my head in my hands, I bowed over the kitchen table and prayed aloud. The words I spoke to God that midnight are still vivid in my memory. I am here taking a stand for what I believe is right. But now I am afraid. The people are looking to me for leadership. And if I stand before them without strength and courage, they too will falter. I am at the end of my powers. I have nothing left. I've come to the point where I can't face it alone. At that moment, I experienced the presence of the divine as I had never experienced God before. It seemed as though I could hear the quiet assurance of an inner voice saying, stand up for justice, stand up for truth, and God will be at your side forever. Almost at once my fears began to go. My uncertainty disappeared. I was ready to face anything. That of course is the witness of disciples throughout the ages. To be known and to be seen by God is to have the courage and have the inner power have the inner vision to go where you think you're not able to go. To go without fear, or at least with fear that it said its prayers. To go with the, uncert with the certainty that the one who loves you unconditionally before you were made is the one who matters we can become ready to face anything when we know that we are known and found and loved. For me, that is freeing. And most times it's a revelation. Amen. I invite you now to join me in the recitation of the Nicene Creed, the ancient faith of the church. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, 
of one being with the Father. Through him, all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray to God who is made manifest in Jesus Christ. As the prophet Isaiah rang out, arise, shine, for your light has come. Empower your church, O God, to bring out the good news of the light of your son, Jesus, which pierces even the deepest darkness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As a star rose high into the nighttime sky to draw the nations to the Christ child, send your blessing, O God, on this nation and every nation and draw the whole world to your peace and truth. Lord, in your mercy, as John the Baptist guided throngs of people to the edge of the wilderness and baptized Jesus in the River Jordan, we pray that you would guide our country and our leaders to the ways of justice and righteousness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Like the Magi who traveled from afar to bring gifts and celebrate the Savior's birth, we pray for this community and for all the celebrations in our lives. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As Jesus climbed the mountaintop and proclaimed blessings on the people of the world, we pray for the sick and the distressed, the poor and the lame. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As Jesus called his disciples to leave their nets and boats and follow him, we pray for those we love and who have answered your call to follow Jesus to your heavenly kingdom. Give them your peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus, light of the world, hear our prayers and make us reflections of your light, that the places of darkness in our world would be pierced by your light and that all nations would be drawn to you and be overwhelmed with joy. Amen. I invite you one at a time to Unmute yourself if there are petitions or intercessions or thanksgivings that you would like to offer. Firstly, we pray for Shannon's father's eyesight, who's struggling with double vision um, and struggling to have that surgery be successful. We pray for the safety of all those in government during this inauguration week. Pray for the president-elect, Joe Biden Jr., as he becomes the United States president. 
You remember the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. on the anniversary of his birth. And those who have other petitions and intercessions are welcome to say them at this time. Almighty God, by the hand of Moses, your servant, you led your people out of slavery and made them free at last. Grant that your church, following the example of your prophet, Martin Luther King, may resist the oppression in the name of your love and may strive to secure for all your children the blessed liberty of the gospel of Jesus Christ who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Almighty and eternal God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, mercifully accept these prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole hearts. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. We sum up all our petitions and prayers and intercessions by praying the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Good morning again. This is the time, as you know, that if we were in church, uh, we would get up and offer one another the peace and have the time of the offering and announcements. So we can't offer each other the peace um, in the same physical way, but uh, peace to all of you. I do want to uh, mention a couple of announcements and uh, perhaps if we could go on to gallery view without the slide for a minute um, so I can see if there are others. There we go. Uh, two announcements that I can think of right at the top of my head. You should all have received an announcement email on Friday, I believe, um, that would have come, I think, Julie, did you say from a constant contact address? Is that right? It actually comes from my email, um, but Constant Context sends it. I know it's confusing, but because somehow, and somehow because Constant Context sends it, um, even if I'm in your contact list, you may not have gotten it. It may have gone into promotions. Um, so I am interested in anybody who didn't receive it. If you could just email me separately and we'll try to figure out how to get it to you in your primary context because um, it's something we want to start sending out weekly. 
so on hopefully on Fridays we'll send out that out. But uh, if you didn't get the announcement sheet, and it's very colorful and you'll know it when you see it, uh, look in your either spam, promotions, or social tabs and see if it's there. And you should be able to find a button, but I don't know where it would be on each of your um, devices, a button that would say um, move to, and then you would want to move it to your primary inbox. And then there's also a way to say, always put this in your primary inbox. But you're, I don't know how to do that for everybody offhand. So uh, check with Julie about that. My second announcement is to, uh, is to encourage you to come on Tuesday evening to a three week book study I'm going to do on this book. This is in that announcement thing called Tom Tyranny. And Timothy Snyder wrote this um, actually, I think in 2015. And basically it was advice for how to deal with, uh, 2017, excuse me, how to deal with authoritarian politics. And my goal in this three week study is to look at those lessons that he provides and see which ones are applicable to us. And then to uh, think about what sort of Christian lessons do we have as Christians that would help us in this time of civic um, uncertainty to say the least. So I hope it's a practical sort of experience for all of us, I might call it a piece of constructive theology. So um, I hope you might come to that. I invited the whole diocese. So there are people from various other churches who are coming and it would be pleasing to me if some folks from St. James came. Uh, send me an email if you're interested and I will uh, send you the Zoom link for it. It's from seven to eight for the next three Tuesdays. Does anybody else have any announcements that we need to make at this time? I see no hands and I see no people going off mute. So I'm gonna check the chat real quick and I don't see any on chat. So um, with that, oh, I'm sorry, one more announcement. Do not forget that January 31st is our annual meeting and it will be a virtual annual meeting, a Zoom meeting that we'll have during coffee hour. But uh, because of the circumstances, uh, that's how we'll hold the annual meeting and we'll designate uh, members of Bishop's Committee, delegates to uh, diocesan convention. And there's one more set of people we have to but I can't remember offhand. Anyway, um, December or January 31st, please put that on your calendar. Okay, so we are now ready for our offertory anthem um, performed by our virtual choir.
may Christ, the Son of God, be manifest in you, that your lives may be a light to the world. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Creator, the Christ, and the Holy Spirit, may Christ, the Son of God, be among you and those be manifest who love in you, and remain with that you your always. lives may be a light Amen. to the world. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Creator, the Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Christ, the Son of God, be among you and the Holy Spirit. Be manifest in you and remain with you. Your lives may be. Our closing hymn is Lift Every Voice and Sing. to the world in peace, be of good courage, hold fast to that which is good, render no one evil for evil, strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the afflicted, honor everyone, love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Okay, everybody. Oh, let me let me end and say goodbye to our Facebook friends.